Any other? That's the grandfathers and the faces of the grandmothers swell with greater pride as they saw their children and their grandchildren praising the Lord in what they did today. Praise the Lord for that. <clears throat> what a wonderful thing it is for us at the end of each year to think more particularly of uh, the birth of Jesus. Today, <clears throat> uh, I want to review with you the last two sermons that I've taken here. I won't ask you what they were about and embarrass you like I did last time. But today I want quickly to look at what we said about Gideon. And if you want to follow, this is going to be a quick review, 1 Samuel 16. No, um, 1 Samuel 9. For Gideon. Let's just bow our heads. Father in heaven, we now uh, have the opened word uh, before us. And in thy word is power. Um, may this power shine to us and may we be aware of it today. Amen. <clears throat> he was Gideon threshing wheat in a wine press uh, because the children of Israel were under very heavy domination by a foreign land, by a foreign people. And the angel of the Lord came to Gideon and <clears throat> the story of Gideon ensued. And you remember <clears throat> that the angel came and he said, I'm still in the wrong place, I'm sorry. We should be in Joshua 6. How silly of me. Joshua 6. <clears throat> Israel was greatly impoverished. If you, want to, if you want to follow in the Bible, I'm going to do it fast. Chapter 6, verse 11. There came an angel of the Lord, sat under the oak tree, which you know for it, but pertained unto Joash, the Abbey Israel, and his son Israel, three sweet. <clears throat> the Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. This was the first thing that the angel said to Gideon to encourage him with regard to what was to follow. The second thing that the angel said was in verse 14, Go in thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent thee? This is the first indication that Gideon uh, is to do the will of God in fighting the Midianites. Go down to verse 13, Surely I'll be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. There's the third encouragement that the Lord gave to Gideon as far as doing the work that he was going to do. Verse 21, Then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of his staff that was in his hand and touched the flesh and the unleavened and cakes and this was the little uh, present, this was the little meal that Gideon had uh, provided. And there rose up a fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and unleavened cakes. And this was another very real encouragement that the Lord was giving to Gideon to think in terms of fighting the Midianites. And the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. You're not going to die because you've seen an angel. Uh, Gideon was afeard of that. Another blessing uh, that indicated to him that, that, that he should be fighting these Midianites. <clears throat> and then the next thing came after Gideon went and uh, pulled the, the temple of, of Baal down, remember, and cut the, uh, the groves. And the men of the town the next day wanted to kill him. His father came out and said, uh, And Joash said unto all that stood against him, Will ye plead for Baal? Will ye save him? He that will plead for him, let him be put to death. Don't put to death uh, my son, who has knocked the idol of Baal down, but kill those who are actually worshipping Baal. Another encouragement that was Gideon, to, Gideon was given by the Lord. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and he blew a trumpet and all of Abiezra came after him. What would make the people of Abiezra, that area around about, come to him? It was the message that he was going to fight the Midianites. 
And Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt save Israel by my hand as thou hast said, you see, he was still uncertain at this stage, after all that, he was still uncertain that he was the man to fight the Israelites. Behold, I will put a fleece of wool on the floor, and if the dew be on the fleece only, and it be dry upon the earth, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by mine hand. What happened next, children? You'll know. What happened next to encourage him? <laughs> the next night, it was the opposite way around. You see, the Lord was trying to convince Gideon that he had a tremendous work to do and that he would bless him in the things that he did. Gideon was still afraid. And the Lord said unto Gideon, and then, then he called everybody in. And, and who can tell me how many people came to fight with him? There were 32,000 people come. Chapter 7, verse 2, And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with me, with thee, are too many. And so the Lord said, Give them the opportunity to go back if they've got any fear or if they're afraid. Gideon shrunk. He was one who wanted to go back. He didn't want to go and fight the Midians, even after the encouragement that the Lord had given him. And so the army was whittled down to 10,000 people from 32,000. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many. 10,000 people to destroy the hundreds of thousands of Philistines that you're going to defeat are too many because if, if you defeat the Philistines, you'll be able to take it upon yourself saying, Well, look what a good thing I've done. So he brought down the people to the water, and the Lord said unto Gideon, Everyone that lappeth of the water with his tongue as a dog lappeth, him shalt thou set him likewise, everyone that boweth down upon his knees to drink. How many soldiers was he left with, children? 300. 300 out of how many? 32,000. Less than 10% of his original army. And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the three hundred men that lapped will I save you and deliver the Midians. I mentioned the Philistines before. It was the Midianites into thine hand. And all the other people go, every man unto his place. But even so, Gideon was still not sure that he was prepared to do this. And so the Lord said to him, Arise, get thee down unto the host, for I have delivered into thine hand. And Ellen White says at that point of time, Gideon trembled. <laughs> and wouldn't you? The Lord was telling him to go down to the, into the camp of the Midianites. Uh, but if thou fear to go down, go down and with fear of thy servant down to the host. And thou shalt hear what they say, and afterwards shall thine hand be strengthened. And they crept down into the uh, Midianites, and there were Malachites there as well. And they were like grasshoppers for multitude. Their camels were without number, as the sand by the seaside for multitude. And as uh, Gideon and his servant were listening, there was a man told a dream. And they were listening, and they could hear this dream. They were sitting by the campfire. <clears throat> and there was a... Um, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of Midian. What a strange dream. And, and came to a tent and smote it and fell and overturned it. Uh, and the fellow answered, one of his fellows answered, this is nothing else than the sword of Gideon. What sword of Gideon? Gideon wasn't a soldier. He wasn't a challenge to the Midianites. Who was it that told these Midianites that they ought to be afraid of Gideon and his sword? the son of Joash, a man of Israel, for in his hand hath God delivered Midian and all the hosts. Well, that was a good attitude to go to battle with that the Midianites had, wasn't it? They realised, even before the battle started, that they were going to lose it. And uh, after that, Gideon worshipped God to show that he was now ready, after all these encouragements, to follow him and do his will. And he was, given, uh, in, uh, he was given instructions by God to divide his men into three camps. You know the story. And, and, and soon enough, what did the men shout as they smashed their pitchers and the lights shone through? What did they shout? What did they shout? Where was it? Here it says, the sword of the Lord and Gideon. 
Maybe you'd got that message from the Midianites. And so they won the battle. The Midianites ran away. Many, many, many slaughtered. And uh, Gideon became a great man. And then he became the leader, the judge, the leader of Israel for, for 40 years. You see, Gideon was a man, uh, was a person who didn't want to do what God wanted him to do. God came to him and gave him all these encouragements so that he would be happy to do the work of uh, leading the children of Israel in battle. Come over to 1 Samuel 9 now. My next sermon was the story of Saul. Now, <clears throat> he was a Benjamite. His father was a rich man and had great influence. And he, he had a son. This was Kish, the son of Abiel. Kish had a son whose name was Saul, a choice young man and goodly. And there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he, for his shoulders and upward he was higher than any of the people. He was the giant of Israel. From his shoulders upward he was above, he was the tallest man in all of Israel and he was very well known. And as he went out one day to look for his father's asses with his servant, they travelled and travelled, they walked and they walked, but couldn't find the asses. And so it was suggested that they go and see the the seer, who was Samuel, in, in Ramah, to see if he could tell him where the asses were. Saul had no idea at all of his future at this time. And so, <clears throat> they came to the town, they went up the hill and to the city, they found young maidens going out to draw water, and said unto them, Is the seer here? How many messages in the Bible were given by young maidens going to wells. And one day I'll preach a sermon about the well, well, well. And they answered and said, He is, behold, he's before you. And so they went up and they found Samuel and greeted him. And uh, Samuel sort of took conversation and said, Tomorrow about this time, uh, the Lord had said to Samuel, Tomorrow about this time I'll send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin and thou shalt anoint him to be captain over the people of Israel. You see, the people wanted a king. They didn't want a judge. They didn't want a prophet. They wanted a king, a person who would lead them out in battle and, and fight all their, their enemies and defeat all the soldiers against them. And Samuel didn't really want this to happen because he was the prophet. But the Lord had told him that tomorrow you're going to meet a man and... Um, this is the man who's going to deliver the people out of the hands of the Philistines. Uh, and when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said unto him, Behold, the man whom I spake to thee of, this is the same that shall reign over my people. And he was to be the king. And then he was invited to go up to the sacrifice and to the feast. And he told them that his asses had been found, not to worry about them. They went to the feast he had private conversations with Samuel, and uh, Samuel communed with Saul upon the, the uh, top of the house. They arose early in the morning, and it came, and Samuel called Saul to the top of the house, saying, Up, that I may send thee away. And Saul arose, and they went out, both of them, he and Samuel the board. And as they were going down the end of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Bid the servant pass on. He passed on, but stand thou still, while that I may show thee the word of God. Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head and kissed him and said, it is, not, is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? Can you imagine how Saul may have been sort of shaking in his boots at that moment? And then Samuel told him things that would encourage him to believe the word that he was going to be the king of Israel. He told him that he would meet some prophets. He told him that he'd meet his, hun his uncle. He, he told him that they would meet people who had food to give to them. And he was told that the spirit of the Lord will come upon thee and thou shalt prophesy. And thou shalt be turned into another man. Saul was to be given the challenge of being the king of Israel. God is with thee, Samuel said. Oh, how I would love that the, uh, an angel would come and say to me, God is with thee. And this encouraged Saul in some respects 
to be the leader. God gave him another heart and all those signs came to pass that day. And so the time came when uh, Samuel was uh, able to uh, crown Saul as uh, the king of Israel. And this was the first king of Israel and he was able to lead the people of Israel as their king, as their military leader. <clears throat> and he reigned for 40 years. He was a little bit indifferent at first, but he was given encouragement by the Lord uh, to serve him as king. And he was king for 40 years. But Saul, although he did a lot of good and he fought a lot of battles and he won a lot of battles, he did a lot of good for the people of Israel, but there arose something in his heart and that was pride. And the time came that he failed to take or to seek the instructions of God. And Samuel was the one who had to go to Saul and tell him that he was not going to be the king of Israel any longer. And if we go over to 1 Samuel 16, we'll have a quick, a quick look at what happened after that. And we'll start reading verse 1. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul? Samuel loved Saul as the king of Israel. How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? After the after the occasion they went out to kill the Amalekites and he brought back the king Agag, Samuel had said to him that you were not going to be king over the children of Israel. You remember Saul as Samuel was parting, ripped part of his garment and Samuel said, just as you have ripped my garment, the kingdom is taken out of your hands and it will be given to a better person than you. Uh, how long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil. He'd done that once before, at least, when he had to go to meet Saul. And go, I will send thee to Jesli, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me there a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go if Saul hear it? He will kill me. The relationship between Samuel and Saul here was not good. And uh, if Saul had heard that Samuel was going out of his town, he would be after him like a shot to kill him. And the Lord said, Take an heifer with thee and say, I'm come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show thee what thou shalt do. And thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. And Samuel did that which the Lord spake and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Come you peaceably? Yes, he said, peaceably. Uh, uh, sanctify yourselves. Come to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass, verse 6, And it came to pass when they had come that he looked, they had the sacrifice. And at this time, Samuel was giving attention to the sons of Jesse to see who the Lord might tell him to anoint. And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto him, Samuel, look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature. What were one of the things that uh, singled Saul out as a leader? His height. This man was also a tall man. Don't look on his countenance or on the height of his stature because I've refused him. You see, Samuel saw this man and said, Right, what such a goodly man he will make, I'm sure, a good king of Israel. But the Lord said, No. And he said, Why? For the man 
Uh, for the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. And we can learn a lesson from that, can't we, in our own lives. Then Jesse called Abinadab, the next eldest, and made him pass. Samuel, he said, neither hath the Lord chosen this. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, neither hath the Lord chosen this. Again, verse 10, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel, and Samuel said unto Jesse, the Lord hath not chosen these. And at this point of time, Samuel was beginning to be a little bit worried, a little bit frustrated and a little bit unsure of himself. And Samuel, verse 11, said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? He thought it through, and he thought, right, there, there might be other children. And there remaineth yet, uh, and he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down, that is to sit down to the feast after they have a sacrifice, till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. <clears throat> now, all these good, healthy, upstanding seven sons of uh, Jesse had come before him and the Lord had rejected them all. Samuel had not been given the instruction to anoint any of those. And he sent and brought him in. Now, he was ruddy, and withal of a beautiful countenance. One of the most famous statues in the world by Michelangelo is called, is called David. And he put into that statue all he could to show an ideal man. Never seen this statue myself. <laughs> I thought that was you. <laughs> Ruddy and withal of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to, but still a teenager. It's not written there. Still a teenager. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. The least of the brethren of Jesse, the youngest son, the one who was out there looking after the sheep on the hills, the lowest in the echelon of the family. And Samuel sees this youth, and the Lord said, and this is he, arise and anoint him. Now, where were we? And the Lord said, and Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. Now, there's a little bit of an interpretation problem there. Uh, according to Ellen White, it says, not in the presence of his brethren, uh, anointed him, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. I don't think Samuel even told David what he was being anointed for. I don't think that David knew that he was being anointed to be the, the next king of Israel, the successor to Saul. But from that day forward, the Lord was with him. Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. Saul had been rejected. And then the Bible says an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. You could explain to that to me one day. And so Joseph, uh, David went back to his sheep. Knowing that he'd been anointed by the prophet, but I don't think being too sure as to what he was being anointed to. But David had determined in his heart, when he was a young person, to stay true to God. And it was in the training time, as he was leading sheep, that the Lord presented himself to him as a shepherd. And I can think of another person who also was sent to herd sheep so that he might learn something. Remember the story of Moses, 40 years. 
Let me read to you what Ellen White says about this. It is the inner worth, the excellency of the heart, that determines our acceptance with the Lord of hosts. She's speaking here about those traits of character which show that you are ready to follow the will of the Lord. How deeply should we feel this truth in the judgment of ourselves and others? But we may be assured that his children will be brought to fill the very place for which they are qualified and will enable to accomplish the very work committed to his hands. Did you learn about the setup in the lesson today? About Joseph, about, um, Joseph? The setup, the whole experience of Joseph was a setup by the Lord so that his will would happen. Enable to accomplish the very work committed to the hands if they will but submit their will to God. And David had done that while he was looking after the sheep of his father in the wilderness. Let me read some more. The great honour conferred upon David did not serve to elate him. The great honour, the great honour was that he'd been anointed by, by Samuel, invited to the feast. Notwithstanding the high position which he was to occupy, he quietly continued his employment, content to await the development of the Lord's plans in his own time, and why? Maybe if Abram, Isaac, and Jacob had made that decision early in their lives, history may have been different. As humble and modest as before his anointing, the shepherd boy returned to the hills and watched and guarded his flocks as tenderly as ever. But with new inspiration... He composed his melodies and played upon his harp. Look at the things that he got education from. Look at the things that he learned from. The forest trees with their green foliage, the vines with their clustering fruit, brightened in the sunshine. The, uh, the, the trees with their foliage swayed in the breeze. These were the things that he learned from. He was learning of God from nature. He beheld the sun flooding the heavens with light coming forth as a bridegroom out of his chamber and rejoicing as a strong man to run a race. David learned from nature. His faith in God was strengthened by what he saw in nature. There were the bold summits of the hills reaching toward the skies. In the faraway distance rode the barren cliffs of the mountain wall of Moab. Above all spread the tender blue of the overarching heavens. And beyond was God. He could not see him, but his works were full of his praise. The light of day, gilding forest, mountain, meadow, stream, carried the mind up to the Father. Fa Father of lights, the author of every good and perfect gift. David allowed himself to be taught of God through nature. The Spirit of God was upon him which enabled him to interpret things. The Spirit of God will come to you if you ask him for that Spirit to learn of him through nature. In contemplation of God and his works, the faculties of David's mind and heart were developing and strengthening for the work of his afterlife. He was doing an apprenticeship here, looking after his father's sheep. An apprenticeship for his service as the king of Israel. He was daily coming into a more intimate communion with God. His mind was constantly penetrating into new depths for fresh themes to inspire his song and to wake the music of his harp. The rich melody of his voice poured out upon the air, echoed from the hills as if responsive to the rejoicing of the angel's song in heaven. I haven't been called by God 
to be the king of Israel. And, and you, you are Israel. I haven't been called of God to, to go out and lead men in war. Um, I, I haven't been called by God to be a leader in his nation. Have you? Have you been called by God to do anything? Have you ever felt in your life that God was calling you to do something that inexplicably you had a great compulsion to do? Is, have you ever experienced the Spirit of God in your life teaching you what to do? Has the Spirit of God ever come to you as it came to Gideon to encourage you, to convince you that you can do the things that the Lord would ask you to do? Moses didn't want to serve the Lord either. You remember what he said? I can't go back there. It's, it's so long, I've lost the language, I can't speak. Don't worry about that, Moses. Your brother Aaron is coming to see you and he will be your mouthpiece. Every problem that you can put forward in front of the Lord, he can knock down without any trouble at all. Gideon, <laughs> was, you probably say he was forced to be the army leader. God didn't give him much chance to say no, did he? And, and, and Saul was a humble man to start off with and he was quite happy to lead the people of Israel but he fell because of his personality defects. And here is the story of another man who was called by God to be a leader in his work, to do something really important. And he, as Joseph did, when Joseph at last had his last look at those mountains where he knew his father's tents were before he went into Egypt, he said, I will serve and I will be faithful to the God of my fathers. And because of that decision, all the other things fell in place afterwards, even though there were problems. We may not have big things to do, we might only have little things to do. And our life, our thing to do might just be to live a faithful Christian life in the place where you live, to be a faithful witness. Ellen White says that the greatest sermon that can ever be preached is the life of a loving and a lovable Christian. Do you want to be a loving and a lovable Christian today? Do you want to accept the challenge that the Lord gives you to live that life? Be like David. Consecrate your will to him. Be, be learning of him. Learn the lessons of life through your experiences, but never lose faith in him. I just hope and pray that in this coming year, which is coming soon, you may be able to see very clearly in your life the things that Jesus wants you to do. They may be big, they may be little. Take strength in the life of David.